Hello, good evening everyone and welcome to the study of Book 7 of Plato's Republic, the book in which we find his Allegory of the Cave, probably one of the most famous pieces of philosophical writing um, the world's ever known, I suppose, the Plato's Allegory of the Cave, so we'll get to that in good time. As I always like to do as we begin these streams is quickly review what was discussed in Book 6 and then preview what's coming in Book 7. So in Book 6, there was Plato's discussion of the philosopher, the prejudice against philosophy and the corruption of the philosophic nature of society. And I commented that Socrates was ultimately put to death by that very society uh, for corrupting the youth, according to Miletus, I think it was, in the, um, in the Apology. The philosopher ruler is not impossible, the good as the ultimate object of knowledge, the simile of the sun and the divided line. And the allegory of the cave, it builds upon and grows out of the simile of the sun and the divided line. So for us to fully understand the allegory of the cave, we sort of need to understand the simile of the good and the divided line because they sort of all build up on, upon one another and each thing builds upon the next and then in book seven we begin the very start of the dialogue is the simile of the cave and then we move into the education of the philosopher um, Plato digressed many books ago and got off topic and started um, discussing the um, the family nature the role of the females and children in the society and then, yeah, um, the the nature of the philosopher, and now he comes back to where he began his digression, and we uh, f begin with the education of the philosopher. You have the primary education, and then the five mathematical studies, which is a um, very interesting, uh, yeah, course of study from Plato. The five mathematical studies are arithmetic, plane geometry, solid geometry astronomy and harmonics and then we come to dialectic and the selection and curriculum which is a more broader view of the educational process so all that's coming up in book seven um hello there nathan allard welcome to the study i hope you'll be able to to join for the whole thing so yeah guys as always if you enjoy these studies and the live reads at book club be sure to like the video subscribe to the channel um, comment in the live chat and the best way to support me here would be to share this stream the link on your social media and with your friends so that we can help the channel grow and there's other ways to support if you feel inclined in the description but for now we will be reading the republic book seven The simile of the cave. This is a more graphic presentation of the truths presented in the analogy of the line. In particular, it tells more about the two states of mind called in the line analogy, belief and illusion. We are shown the ascent of the mind from illusion to pure philosophy and the difficulties which accompany its progress. And the philosopher, when he has achieved the supreme vision, is required to return to the cave and serve his fellows, his very unwillingness to do so being his chief qualification. As Cornford pointed out, the best way to understand the simile is to replace the clumsier apparatus of the cave with the cinema, though today television is an even better comparison. It is the moral and intellectual condition of the average man from which Plato starts, and though clearly the ordinary man knows the difference between substance and shadow in the physical world, the simile suggests that his moral and intellectual opinions often bear as little relation to the truth as the average film or television program does to real life. And now we move into the actual text. Next, I said, compare the effect of education and of the lack of it on our nature to an experience like this. Imagine human beings living in an underground cave-like dwelling, with an entrance a long way up, which is both open to the light and as wide as the cave itself. 
They've been there since childhood, fixed in the same place, with their necks and legs fettered, able to see only in front of them, because their bonds prevent them from turning their heads around. Light is provided by a fire burning far above and behind them. Also behind them, but on higher ground, there is a path stretching between them and the fire. Imagine that along this path a low wall has been built, like the screen in front of puppeteers, above which they show their puppets. I'm imagining it. I'm imagining it. <laughs> then also imagine that there are people along the wall, carrying all kinds of artefacts that project above it. Statues of people and other animals made out of stone, wood and every material. And, as you'd expect, some of the carriers are talking, and some are silent. It's a strange image you're describing, and strange prisoners. They're like us. Do you suppose, first of all, that these prisoners see anything of themselves and one another, besides the shadows that the fire casts on the wall in front of them? How could they, if they have to keep their heads motionless throughout life? What about the things being carried along the wall? Isn't the same true of them? Of course. And if they could talk to one another, don't you think they'd suppose that the names they'd used applied to the things they see passing before them? They'd have to. And what if their prison also had an echo from the wall facing them? Don't you think they'd believe that the shadows passing in front of them were talking whenever one of the carriers passing along the wall was doing so? I certainly do. Then the prisoners would in every way believe that the truth is nothing other than the shadows of those artefacts. They, mu they must surely believe that. Consider then what being released from their bonds and cured of their ignorance would naturally be like, if something like this came to pass. When one of them was freed and suddenly compelled to stand up, turn his head, walk and look up towards the light, he'd be pained and dazzled and unable to see the things whose shadows he'd seen before. What do you think he'd say if we told him that what he'd seen before was inconsequential, but that now, because he's a bit closer to the things that are and is turned towards things that are more, he sees more correctly? I'll read that again because I'm not sure if I missed a bit. What do you think he'd say if we told him that what he'd seen before was inconsequential, but that now, because he's a bit closer to the things that are, and is turned towards things that are more, he sees more correctly? Or to put it another way, if we pointed to each of the things passing by and asked him what each of them is, and compelled him to answer, don't you think he'd be at a loss, and that he'd believe that the things he saw earlier were truer than the ones he was now being shown? Much truer. And if someone compelled him to look at the light itself, wouldn't his eyes hurt, and wouldn't he turn around and flee towards the things he's able to see, believing that they're really clearer than the ones he's being shown? He would. And if someone dragged him away from there by force up the rough, steep path, and didn't let him go until he had dragged him into the sunlight, wouldn't he be pained and irritated at being treated that way? And when he came into the light with the sun filling his eyes, wouldn't he be unable to see a single one of the things now said to be true? He would be unable to see them, at least at first. I suppose, then, that he'd need time to get adjusted before he could see things in the world above. At first he'd see shadows most easily, then images of men and other things in water, then the things themselves. Of these he'd be able to study the things in the sky, and the sky itself more easily at night, looking at the light of the stars and the moon than during the day, looking at the sun and the light of the sun, of course. Finally, I suppose, he'd be able to see the sun, not images of it in water or some alien place, but the sun itself, in its own place, and be able to study it. Necessarily so. And at this point he would infer and conclude that the sun provides the seasons and the years, governs everything in the visible world, and is in some way the cause of all the things that he used to see. It's clear that would be his next step. <clears throat> what about when he reminds himself of his first dwelling place, his fellow prisoners, and what passed for wisdom there? Don't you think that he'd count himself happy for the change and pity the others? Certainly. 
And if there had been any honours, praises or prizes among them for the one who was sharpest at identifying the shadows as they passed by, and who best remembered which usually came earlier, which later, and which simultaneously, and who could thus best divine the future, do you think that our man would desire these rewards or envy those among the prisoners who were honoured and held power? Instead, wouldn't he feel with Homer that he'd much prefer to work the earth as a serf to another, one without possessions, and go through any sufferings rather than share their opinions and live as they do? I suppose he would rather suffer anything than live like that. Consider this too. If this man went down into the cave again and sat down in his same seat, wouldn't his eyes coming suddenly out of the sun like that be filled with darkness? They certainly would. And before his eyes had recovered and the adjustment would not be quick, while his vision was still dim, if he had to compete again with the perpetual prisoners in recognising the shadows, wouldn't he invite ridicule? Wouldn't it be said of him that he had returned from his upward journey with his eyesight ruined and that it isn't worth while even to try to travel upward? And as for anyone who tried to, f to free them and lead them upward, if they could somehow get their hands on him, wouldn't they kill him? They certainly would. This whole image, Glaucon, must be fitted together with what we said before. The visible realm should be likened to the prison dwelling and the light of the fire inside it to the power of the sun. And if you interpret the upward journey and the study of things above as the upward journey of the soul to the intelligible realm, you'll grasp what I hope to convey, since that is what you wanted to hear about. Whether it's true or not, only the God knows. But this is how I see it. In the knowable realm, the form of the good is the last thing to be seen, and it is reached only with difficulty. Once one has seen it, however, one must conclude that it is the cause of all that is correct and beautiful in anything, that it produces both light and its source in the visible realm, and that in the intelligible realm it controls and provides truth and understanding, so that anyone who is to act sensibly in private or public must see it. I have the same thought, at least as far as I am able. Come then, share with me this thought also. It isn't surprising that the ones who get to this point are unwilling to occupy themselves with human affairs, and that their souls are always pressing upwards, eager to spend their time above, for, after all, this is surely what we'd expect, if indeed things fit the image I described before. It is. What about what happens when someone turns from divine study to the evils of human life? Do you think it's surprising, since his sight is still dim, and he hasn't yet become accustomed to the darkness around him, that he behaves awkwardly and appears completely ridiculous, if he's compelled, either in the courts or elsewhere, to contend about the shadows of justice or the statues of which they are the shadows, and to dispute about the way these things are understood by people who have never seen justice itself? That's not surprising at all. No, it isn't. But anyone with any understanding would remember that the eyes may be confused in two ways and from two causes, namely, when they've come from the light into the darkness and when they've come from the darkness into the light. Realising that the same applies to the soul, when someone sees a soul disturbed and unable to see something, he won't laugh mindlessly, but he'll take into consideration whether it has come from a brighter life and is dimmed through not having yet become accustomed to the dark, or whether it has come from greater ignorance into greater light and is dazzled by the increased brilliance. Then he'll declare the first soul happy in its experience and life, and he'll pity the latter. But even if he chose to make fun of it, at least he'd be less ridiculous than if he laughed at a soul that has come from the light above. What you say is very reasonable. If that's true, then here's what we must think about these matters. Education isn't what some people declare it to be, namely, putting knowledge into souls that lack it, like putting sight into blind eyes. They do say that. But our present discussion, on the other hand, shows that the power to learn is present in everyone's soul, and that the instrument with which each learns is like an eye that cannot be turned around from darkness to light without turning the whole body.
This instrument cannot be turned around from that which is coming into being without turning the whole soul until it is able to study that which is and the brightest thing that is, namely, the one we call the good. Isn't that right? Yes. Then education is the craft concerned with doing this very thing, this turning around, and with how the soul can most easily and effectively be made to do it. It isn't the craft of putting sight into the soul. Education takes for granted that sight is there, but that it isn't turned the right way or looking where it ought to look, and it tries to redirect it appropriately. So it seems. Now, it looks as though the other so-called virtues of the soul are akin to those of the body, for they really aren't there beforehand but are added later by habit and practice. However, the virtue of reason seems to belong above all to something more divine, which never loses its power but is either useful and beneficial, or useless and harmful, depending on the way it is turned. Or have you ever noticed this about people who are said to be vicious but clever? How keen the vision of their little souls is, <laughs> and how sharply it distinguishes the things it is turned towards? This shows that its sight isn't inferior, but rather is forced to serve evil ends, so that the sharper it sees, the more evil it accomplishes. <laughs> Absolutely. However, if a nature of this sort had been hammered at from childhood and freed from the bonds of kinship with becoming, which have been fastened to it by feasting, greed and other such pleasures and which, like leaden weights, pulls its vision downwards, if, being rid of these, it turned to look at true things, then I say that the same soul of the same person would see these most sharply, just as it now does the things it is presently turned towards. Probably so. And what about the uneducated who have no experience of truth? Isn't it likely, indeed, doesn't it follow necessarily from what was said before, that they will never adequately govern a city, but neither would those who've been allowed to spend their whole lives being educated? The former would fail because they don't have a single goal at which all their actions, public and private, inevitably aim. The latter would fail because they'd refuse to act, thinking that they had settled while still alive in the faraway isles of the blessed. That's true. It is our task as founders, then, to compel the best natures to reach the study we said before is the most important, namely, to make the ascent and see the good. But when they've made it and look sufficiently, we mustn't allow them to do what they're allowed to do today. What's that? To stay there and refuse to go down again to the prisoners in the cave and share their labours and honours, whether they are of less worth or of greater then are we to do them an injustice by making them live a worse life when they could live a better one? You are forgetting again that it isn't the law's concern to make any one class in the city outstandingly happy, but to contrive to spread happiness throughout the city by bringing the citizens into harmony with each other through persuasion or compulsion, and by making them share with each other the benefits that each class can confer on the community. The law produces such people in the city, not in order to allow them to turn in whatever direction they want, but to make use of them to bind the city together. That's true, I had forgotten. Observe then, Glaucon, that we won't be doing an injustice to those who've become philosophers in our city, and that what we'll say to them when we compel them to guard and care for the others will we'll be just. We'll say... When people like you come to be in other cities, they're justified in not sharing their city's labours, for they've grown there spontaneously, against the will of the constitution. And what grows of its own accord, and owes no debt for its upbringing, has justice on its side when it isn't, keen to pay anyone for that upbringing. But we've made you kings in our city, and leaders of the swarm, as it were, both for yourselves, and for the rest of the city. You're better and more completely educated than the others and are better able to share in both types of life. Therefore, each of you in turn must go down to live in the common dwelling place of the others and grow accustomed to seeing in the dark. When you are used to it, you'll see vastly better than the people there, 
And because you've seen the truth about fine, just, and good things, you'll know each image for what it is, and also that of which it is the image. Thus, for you and for us, the city will be governed, not like the majority of cities nowadays by people who fight over shadows and struggle against one another in order to rule, as if that were a great good, but by people who are awake rather than dreaming, for the truth is surely this. A city whose prospective rulers are least eager to rule must of necessity be most free from civil war, whereas a city with the opposite kind of rulers is governed in the opposite way. Absolutely. Then do you think that those we've nurtured will disobey us and refuse to share the labours of the city each in turn while living the greater part of their time with one another in the pure realm? It isn't possible for we'll be giving just orders to just people. Each of them will certainly go to rule as something compulsory, however, which is exactly the opposite of what's done by those who now rule in each city. This is how it is. If you can find a way of life that's better than ruling for the prospective rulers, your well-governed city will become a possibility, for only in it will the truly rich rule. Not those who are rich in gold, but those who are rich in the wealth that the happy must have, namely, a good and rational life. But if beggars hungry for private goods go into public life, thinking that the good is there for the seizing, then the well-governed city is impossible, for the ruling is something fought over, and the civil and domestic war destroys these people and the rest of the city as well. That's very true. Can you name any life that despises political rule besides that of the true philosopher? No, by God, I can't. But surely it is those who are not lovers of ruling who must rule, for if they don't, the lovers of it who are rivals will fight over it. Of course. Then who will you compel to become guardians of the city, if not those who have the best understanding of what matters for good government, and who have other honours than political ones, and a better life as well? No one. So that was the first part, and the next we come to the education of the philosophers. And so, wowzers, I'd like to say thank you to Audrey C., who's given a very kind and generous super chat there. I appreciate that very much, Audrey. Thank you. And hello there, Joe. And so, yeah, that was the um, simile of the cave. And also Plato touched a little bit there on the different ways of ruling the city. And in book eight, we come to the different types of governance. Um, timarchy, oligarchy, democracy and tyranny and Plato goes into these uh, in detail and depth and also shares sort of the individual character and personality of an individual with that sort of temperament but for now we're going to move into for the rest of the book the education of the philosopher and um, if you like the university level the the higher level of education Whereas in book three, I think three or four, he dealt with the basic education. Now we come to the, the higher education. And thank you so much, Audrey. I really appreciate your generosity. So now we get back to the introduction to the next part. The education of the philosopher. Having described the philosopher ruler, Plato proceeds to the further education beyond that described in part 3, necessary to produce him. This further education consists of five mathematical disciplines, arithmetic, plane and solid geometry, astronomy and harmonics, followed by a training in pure philosophy or dialectic in Plato's sense. Though some concessions are made to practical utility, the main stress throughout is on the training of the mind, with the vision of the good as its ultimate objective, and mathematics is to be studied without any immediate practical or scientific aim in view. As the opening sentences make clear, the education outlined in this part is to be understood in terms of sun, cave and line. The point is re-emphasised towards the end of the part. Preliminary. 
The type of study required must be one that will provoke the mind to thought. Do you want us to, to, to consider now how such people will come to be in our city, and how, just as some are said to have gone up from Hades to the gods, we'll lead them up to the light? Of course I do. This isn't, it seems, a matter of tossing a coin, but of turning a soul from a day that is a kind of night to the true day, the ascent to what is, which we say, is true philosophy. Indeed, then mustn't we try to discover the subjects that have the power to bring this about? Of course. So what subject is it, Glaucon, that draws the soul from the realm of the becoming to the realm of what is? And it occurs to me as I'm speaking that we said, didn't we, that it is necessary for the prospective rulers to be athletes in war when they're young. Yes, we did. Then the subject we're looking for must also have this characteristic in addition to the former one. Which one? It mustn't be useless to warlike men. If it's at all impossible, if it's at all possible, it mustn't. Now, prior to this, we educated them in music and poetry and physical training. We did. And physical training is concerned with what comes into being and dies, for it oversees the growth and decay of the body. Apparently. So it couldn't be the subject we're looking for. No, it couldn't. Then could it be the music and poetry we described before? But that, if you remember, is just the counterpart of physical training. It educated the guardians through habits. Its harmonies gave them a certain harmoniousness, not knowledge. Its rhythms gave them a certain rhythmical quality, and its stories, whether fictional or nearer the truth, cultivated other habits akin to these. But as for the subject you're looking for now, there's nothing like that in music and poetry. Your reminder is exactly to the point. There's really nothing like that in music and poetry. But Glaucon, what is there that does have this? The crafts all seem to be base or mechanical. How could they be otherwise? But apart from music and poetry, physical training and the crafts, what subject is left? Well, if we can't find anything apart from these, let's consider one of the subjects that touches all of them. What sort of thing? For example, that common thing that every craft, every type of thought, and every science uses, and that is among the first compulsory subjects for everyone. What's that? that inconsequential matter of distinguishing the one, the two, and the three. In short, I mean, number and calculation, for isn't it true that every craft and science must have a share in that? They certainly must. Then so must warfare. Absolutely. In the tragedies, at any rate, Palemides is always showing up Agamemnon as a totally ridiculous general. Haven't you noticed? He says that, by inventing numbers, he established how many troops there were in the Trojan army and counted their ships and everything else, implying that they were uncounted before and that Agamemnon, if indeed he didn't know how to count, didn't even know how many feet he had. What kind of general do you think that made him? A very strange one, if that's true. Then won't we set down this subject as compulsory for a warrior so that he is able to count and calculate? more compulsory than anything, if, that is, he's to understand anything about setting his troops in order, or if he's even to be properly human, then do you notice that, do you notice the same thing about this subject than I do? What's that? That this turns out to be one of the subjects we were looking for, that naturally leads to understanding, but no one uses it correctly, namely as something that is really fitted in every way to draw one towards being. What do you mean? I'll try to make my view clear as possible as for I'll try to make my view clear as follows. I'll distinguish for myself the things that do or do not lead in that direction we mentioned. Sorry, I'll start again. I'm uh, making up my own words here. I'll try to make my view clear as follows. I'll distinguish for myself the things that do or don't lead in the direction we mentioned, and you must study them along with me and either agree or disagree, and that way we may come to know more clearly whether things are indeed as I divine. Point them out. I'll point out then, 
if you can grasp it, that some sense perceptions don't summon the understanding to look into them, because the judgment of sense perception is itself adequate, while others encourage it in every way to look into them, because sense perception seems to produce no sound result. You are obviously referring to things appearing in the distance, and to trompe l'oeil paintings. You are not quite getting my meaning. Then what do you mean? The ones that don't summon the understanding are all those that don't go off into opposite perceptions at the same time, but the ones that do go off in that way I call summoners, whenever sense perception doesn't declare one thing any more than its opposite, no matter whether the object striking the senses is near at hand or far away. You'll understand my meaning better if I put it this way. These, we say, are three fingers, the smallest, the second and the middle finger. That's right. Assume that I'm talking about them as being seen from close by. Now, this is my question about them. What? It's apparent that each of them is equally a finger, and it makes no difference in this regard whether the finger is seen to be in the middle or at either end, whether it is dark or pale, thick or thin, or anything else of that sort. For in all these cases an ordinary soul isn't compelled to ask the understanding what a finger is, since sight doesn't suggest to it that a finger is at the same time the opposite of a finger. No, it doesn't. Therefore it isn't likely that anything of that sort would summon or awaken the understanding. No, it isn't. But what about the bigness and smallness of fingers? Does sight perceive them adequately? Does it make no difference to it whether the finger is in the middle or at the end? And is it the same with the sense of touch as regards the thick and the thin, the hard and the soft? And do the other senses reveal such things clearly and adequately? Doesn't each of them rather do the following? The sense set over the hard is, in the first place, of necessity also set over the soft, and it reports to the soul that the same thing is perceived by it to be both hard and soft. That's right. And isn't it necessary that in such cases the soul is puzzled as to what this sense means by hard if it indicates that the same thing is also soft, or what it means by the light and the heavy if it indicates that the heavy is light or the light is heavy? Yes, indeed these are strange reports for the soul to receive, and they do demand to be looked into then it's likely that in such cases the soul, summoning calculation and understanding, first tries to determine whether each of the things announced to it is one or two. Of course. If it's evidently two, won't each be evidently distinct and one? Yes. Then, if each is one and both two, the soul will understand that the two are separate, for it wouldn't understand the inseparable to be two, but rather one. That's right. Sa sight, however, saw the big and small not as separate, but as mixed up together. Isn't that so? Yes. And in order to get clear about all this, understanding was compelled to see the big and the small not as mixed up together, but as separate, the opposite way from sight. True. And isn't it from these cases that it first occurs to us to ask what the big is and what the small is? Absolutely. And because of this we called the one the intelligible and the other the visible. That's right. This, then, is what I was trying to express before, when I said that some things summon thought while others don't. Those that strike the relevant sense at the same time as their opposites I call summoners. Those that don't do this do not awaken understanding. Now I understand and think you are right. The Five Mathematical Studies Mathematics has preeminently the characteristics required in the preliminary stages of education, and Plato proceeds to list the five mathematical disciplines which the philosopher-ruler must study. Arithmetic And just um, quickly, if I can just comment um, before uh, and thanks very much, Audrey. I, I do really appreciate it. I'll just uh, share something that comes across in all of Plato's dialogues. And in that last passage that we were reading, 
he says that the soul knows it to be hard or soft. So through the senses, the soul knows a thing to be hard or soft. But then through the the intellect, it knows it to be more or less. So this goes back to the divided line and the simile of the sun and the cave in the sense that the sense perception exists in the visible realm and the number, you know, two is more than three and one is less than two, that's in the intelligible realm. And in one of the other dialogues, I can't, it was not jumping straight to mind which dialogue it is, but he says that, could be the Phaedo actually, if I had to guess, that When an individual is speaking to another, it's not the mouth that speaks to the ears, but the soul through the mouth speaks to the other person's soul, you know, through the ears. And so this is a, it's a really beautiful passage, I'm sure it's the Phaedo, that in a sense when you're talking to someone, it's two souls talking, but they just happen to use a body because that's how we exist in this life. And, and, and Plato is very similar to um, the Vedanta Bhagavad Gita philosophy in, in the sense that he's constantly speaking about the soul and how the soul is different to the body. The soul animates the body. And when two individuals are talking, um, it's the souls communicating through the body, through the mouth and the ears. And I just wanted to point that out because it came to mind. So a brief digression there if you don't mind and now um, we come to arithmetic well then to which of them do number and the one belong i don't know reason it out from what was said before if the one is adequately seen itself by itself or is so perceived by any of the other senses then as we were saying in the case of fingers it wouldn't draw the soul towards being but, if something offers it to it, is always seen at the same time, so that nothing is apparently any more one than the opposite of one, then something would be needed to judge the matter. The soul would then be puzzled, would look for an answer, would stir up its understanding, and would ask what the one itself is. And so this would be among the subjects that lead the soul and turn it around towards the study of that which is. But surely the sight of the one does possess this characteristic to a remarkable degree, for we see the same thing to be both one and unlimited number at the same time. Then, if it then if this is true of the one, won't it also be true of all numbers? Of course. Now, calculation and arithmetic are wholly concerned with numbers. That's right. Then evidently they lead us towards truth, supernaturally so. Then they belong, it seems, to the subjects we are seeking. They are compulsory for warriors because of their orderly ranks, and for philosophers because they have to learn to rise up out of becoming and grasp being, if they are ever to become rational. That's right. And our guardian must be both a warrior and a philosopher. Certainly. Then it would be appropriate, Glaucon, to legislate this subject for those who are going to share in the highest offices in the city, and to persuade them to turn to calculation and take it up, not as laymen do, but staying with it until they reach the study of the natures of the numbers by means of understanding itself, nor like tradesmen or retailers for the sake of buying and selling, but for the sake of war and for easing turning the soul around away from becoming and towards truth and being. Well put. Moreover, it strikes me, now that it has been mentioned, how sophisticated the subject of calculation is, and how many ways it is useful for our purposes, provided that one practice it, practices it for the sake of knowing, rather than trading. How is it useful? In the very way we were talking about, it leads the soul forcibly upward and compels it to discuss the numbers themselves, never permitting any one to propose for discussion numbers attached to visible or tangible bodies. You know what those who are clever in these matters are like. If, in the course of the argument, someone tries to divide the one itself, they laugh and won't permit it. 
If you divide it, they multiply it, taking care that one thing never be found to be many parts rather than one. That's very true. Then what do you think would happen, Glaucon, if someone were to ask them, What kind of numbers are you talking about, in which the one is, as you assume it to be, each one equal to every other, without the least difference and containing no internal parts? I think they'd answer that they are talking about those numbers that can be grasped only in thought and can't be dealt with in any other way. Then do you th see that it's likely that this subject really is compulsory for us, since it apparently compels the soul to use understanding itself on the truth itself? Indeed, it most certainly does do that. And what about those who are naturally good at calculation or reasoning? Have you already noticed that they're naturally sharp, so to speak, in all subjects, and that those who are slow at it, if they're educated and exercised in it, even if they're benefited in no other way, nonetheless improve and become generally sharper than they were? That's true. Moreover, I don't think you'll easily find subjects that are harder to learn or practice than this. No, indeed. Then, for all these reasons, this subject isn't to be neglected, and the best natures must be educated in it. I agree. Now we come to plain geometry. As with arithmetic, the emphasis is on intellectual training, not practical usefulness, with the vision of the form of the good as the ultimate objective. So Plato's giving all of these mathematical educational um, <clears throat> subjects, like it says there, not not on practical usefulness, but intellectual training, to train the mind to think properly. Let that then be one of our subjects. Second, let's consider whether the subject that comes next is also appropriate for our purposes. What subject is that? Do you mean geometry? That's the very one I had in mind. In so far as it pertains to war, it's obviously appropriate. For when it comes to setting up camp, occupying a region, concentrating troops, deploying them, or with regard to any of the other formations an army adopts in battle or on the march, it makes all the difference whether someone is a geometer or not. But for things like that, even a little geometry or calculation for that matter would suffice. What we need to consider is whether the greater and more advanced part of it tends to make it easier to see the form of the good. And we say that anything has that tendency if it compels the soul to turn itself around towards the region in which lies the happiest of the things that are, the one the soul must see at any cost. You're right. Therefore, if geometry compels the soul to study being, it's appropriate, but if it compels it to study becoming, it's inappropriate. So we've said at any rate. Now. No one with even a little experience of geometry will dispute that the science is entirely the opposite of what is said about it in the accounts of its practitioners. What do you mean? They give ridiculous accounts of it, though they can't help it, for they speak like practical men, and all their accounts refer to doing things. They talk of squaring, applying, adding, and the like, whereas the entire subject is pursued for the sake of knowledge. Absolutely. And mustn't we also agree on a further point? What is that? That their accounts are for the sake of knowing what always is, not what comes into being and passes away. That's easy to agree to, for geometry is knowledge of what always is. Then it draws the soul towards truth and produces philosophic thought by directing upwards what we now wrongly direct downwards, as far as anything possibly can. Then as far as we possibly can, we must require those in your fine city not to neglect geometry in any way, for even its by-products are not insignificant. What are they? The ones concerned with war that you mention. But we also surely know that, when it comes to better understanding any subject, there is a world of difference between someone who has grasped the geometry and someone who hasn't. Yes, by God, a world of difference. Then shall we set this down as a second subject for the for the young? Let's do so, he said. The third, solid geometry. Though work was being done on solid geometry in Plato's day, the subject was still, as he makes clear, relatively undeveloped. 
and uh, I think the the fundamental or foundational work is um, Euclidean geometry, and there's also I listened to Eric Weinstein Weinstein, and he talks about non-Euclidean geometry, and that's way beyond my grasp, and even um, Euclid is beyond my grasp if I'm honest but I think that's like the source text to go to about a uh, fundamental geometry and if I'm misspeaking let me know in the comments and what about astronomy shall we make it the third or do you disagree that's fine with me for a better awareness of the seasons months and years is no less appropriate for a general than for a farmer or nav navigator you amuse me you're like someone who's afraid that the majority will think he is prescribing useless subjects. It's no easy task. Indeed, it's very difficult to realize that in every soul there is an instrument that is purified and rekindled by, by such subjects when it has been blinded and destroyed by other ways of life, an instrument that it is more important to preserve than ten thousand eyes, since only with it can the truth be seen. Those who share your belief that this is so will think you're speaking incredibly well, while those who've never been aware of it will probably think you're talking nonsense, since they see no benefit worth mentioning in these subjects. So decide right now which group you're addressing, or are your arguments for neither of them, but mostly for your own sake, though you won't begrudge anyone else whatever benefit he's able to get from them. The latter. I want to speak, question and answer, mostly for my own sake. Then let's fall back to our earlier position, for we were wrong just now about the subject that comes after geometry. What was our error? After plane surfaces, we went on to revolving solids before dealing with solids by themselves. But the right thing to do is to take up the third dimension right after the second, and this, I suppose, consists of cubes and of whatever shares in depth. You're right, Socrates, but this subject hasn't been developed yet. There are two reasons for that. First, because no city values it. This difficult subject is little researched. Second, the researchers need a director, for, without one, they won't discover anything. To begin with, such a director is hard to find, and then, even if he could be found, those who currently do research in this field would be too arrogant to follow him. If an entire city helped him to supervise it, however, and took the lead in valuing it, then he would be followed. And if the subject was consistently and vigorously pursued, it would soon be developed. Even now, when it isn't valued and is held in contempt by the majority and is pursued by researchers who are una unable to give an account of its usefulness, nevertheless, in spite of all these handicaps, the force of its charm has caused it to develop somewhat so that it wouldn't be surprising if it were further developed even as things stand. The subject has outstanding charm, but explain more clearly what, you're, you, what you were saying just now. The subject that deals with plane surfaces you took to be geometry. Yes. And at first you put astronomy after it, but later you went back on that. In my haste to go through them all, I've only progressed more slowly. The subject dealing with the dimension of depth was next, because it is in a ridiculous state. I passed it by and spoke of astronomy, which deals with the motion of things having depth after the geometry. That's right. Then let's put astronomy as the fourth subject on the assumption that solid geometry will be available if a city takes it up. Astronomy In reading Plato's disparagement of observation, here two things should be remembered. One. Plato's primary purpose here is not to advance physical science, but to train the mind to think abstractly. And two, mathematical astronomy was still only just beginning, and until the astronomer has his mathematical tools, he can make no progress. It was the insistence in the academy on the essentially mathematical nature of the problems that led to the rapid progress of astronomy in the 200 years after Plato's death.
Plato himself later gave a higher place to observation in the laws, and it should not be forgotten that in the myth of Ur, coming later in Book 10 and later in the Timaeus, he did try to account in physical terms for the movements of the heavenly bodies. That seems reasonable, and since you reproached me before for praising astronomy in a vulgar manner, I'll now praise it your way, for I think it's clear to everyone that astronomy compels the soul to look upward and leads it from things here to things there. It may be obvious to everyone except me, but that's not my view about it. Then what is your view? As it's practiced today by those who teach philosophy, it makes the soul look very much downward. How do you mean? In my opinion, your conception of higher studies is a good deal too generous, for if someone were to study something by leaning his head back and studying ornaments on a ceiling, it looks as though you'd say he's studying not with his eyes, but with his understanding. Perhaps you're right, and I'm foolish, but I can't conceive of any subject making the soul look upward except one concerned with that which is, and that which is, is invisible. If anyone attempts to learn something about sensible things, whether by gaping upwards or squinting downward, I'd claim, since there's no knowledge of such things, that he never learns anything, and that, even if he studies lying on his back on the ground or floating on it in the sea, his soul is looking not up, but down. You're right to reproach me, and I've been justly punished. But what did you mean when you said that astronomy must be learned in a different way from the way in which it is learned at present, if it is to be a useful subject for our purposes. <clears throat> it's like this. We should consider the decorations in the sky to be the most beautiful and most exact of visible things, seeing that they are embroidered on a visible surface. But we should consider their motions to fall short of the true ones, motions that are really fast or slow as measured in true numbers, that trace out how that chase out true geometrical figures that are all in relation to one another, and that are the true motions of the things carried along in them, and these of course must be grasped by reason and thought, not by sight, or do you think otherwise? Not at all. Therefore, we should use the embroidery in the sky as a model in the study of these other things. If someone experienced in geometry were to come upon plans very carefully drawn and worked out by Daedalus or some other craftsman or artist, he'd consider them to be very finely executed, but he'd think it ridiculous to examine them seriously in order to find the truth in them about the equal, the double, or any other ratio. How could it be anything other than ridiculous? Then don't you think that a real astronomer will feel the same when he looks at the motions of the stars? He'll believe that the craftsmen of the heavens arrange them, and all that's in them in the finest way possible for such things. But as for the ratio of night to day, of days to a month, of a month to a year, or of the motions of the stars to any of them or to each other, don't you think he'll consider it strange to believe that they're always the same and never deviate anywhere at all or try in any sort of way to grasp the truth about them since they're connected to body and visible? That's my opinion anyway, now that I hear it from you. Then if by really taking part in astronomy we're to make the naturally intelligent part of the soul useful instead of useless, let's study astronomy by means of problems as we do geometry and leave the things in the sky alone. The task you're prescribing is a lot harder than anything now attempted in astronomy. And I suppose that, if we are to be of any benefit as lawgivers, our prescriptions for the other subjects will be of the same kind. But have you any other appropriate subject to suggest? Not offhand. Harmonics, which is to be treated on the same principles as astronomy. Well, there isn't just one form of motion, but several. Perhaps a wise, a wise person could list them all, but there are two that are evident even to us. What are they? Besides the one we've discussed, there is also its counterpart. What's that? 
It's likely that as the eyes fasten on astronomical motions, so the ears fasten on harmonic ones, and that the sciences of astronomy and harmonics are closely akin. This is what the Pythagoreans say, Glaucon, and we agree, don't we? We do. And here's a, a reference to Pythagoras, who you might know from his uh, theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, but there's a um, wonderful biography of Pythagoras by Iamblichus that shares a lot more about who Pythagoras the man was, not just a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So this is what the Pythagoreans say, Glaucon, and we agree, don't we? We do. Therefore, since the subject is so huge, shouldn't we ask them what they have to say about harmonic motions and whether there is anything else besides them, all the while keeping our own goal squarely in view? What's that? That those whom we are rearing should never try to learn anything incomplete, anything that doesn't reach the end that everything should reach. <coughs> Excuse me. The end we mentioned just now in the case of astronomy. Or don't you know that people do something similar in harmonics? Measuring audible consonances and sounds against one another, they labour in vain, just like present-day astronomers. Yes, by the gods, and pretty ridiculous they are too. They talk about something they call a dense interval, or quarter tone, putting their ears to their instruments, like someone trying to overhear what the neighbours are saying. <laughs> trying to overhear what the neighbours are saying. And some say that they hear a tone in between and that it is the shortest interval by which they must measure, while others argue that this tone sounds the same as a quarter tone, both put ears before understanding. You mean those excellent fellows who torment their strings, torturing them and stretching them on pegs? I won't draw out the analogy by speaking of blows with the plectrum or the accusations or denials and boastings on the part of the strings. Instead, I'll cut it short by saying that these aren't the people I'm talking about. The ones I mean are the ones we just said were going to question about harmonics, for they do the same as the astronomers. They seek out the numbers that are to be found in these audible consonances, but they do not make the ascent to problems. They don't investigate, for example, which numbers are consonant and which aren't, or what the explanation is of each. But that would be a superhuman task. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yet it's useful in the search for the beautiful and the good, but pursued for any other purpose, it's useful. It's... Excuse me. Yet it's useful in the search for the beautiful and the good, but pursued for any other purpose, it's useless. Probably so. Now we move on to dialectic, which is a big part of um, the Socratic method, and you can find it in Sophists and Statesmen also. Dialectic. The mathematical studies are only the pre preliminary to dialectic. We are reminded of the lion and cave. Dialectic is the exercise of pure thought, the highest section of the line. Its object is the vision of the good, the last stage in the ascent from the cave, when the eye can look at the sun itself. Plato does not profess to give here a full account of dialectic, but we learn some important things about it. It is a process of rational argument. It is, cru it is critical for assumptions, which it destroys and relates to a first principle. It tries to grasp what each thing is in itself. It culminates in coherent knowledge and in an apprehension of the form of the good. <coughs> Moreover, I take it that if inquiry into <coughs> Moreover, I take it that if inquiry into all the subjects we've mentioned brings out their association and relationship with one another and draws conclusions about their kinship, it does contribute something to our goal and isn't labour in vain, but that otherwise it is in vain. I too divine that this is true, but you're still talking about a very big task, Socrates. Do you mean the prelude or what? Or don't you know that all these subjects are merely preludes to the song itself that must also be learned? 
Surely you don't think that people who are clever in these matters are dialecticians? No, by God, I don't, although I have met a few exceptions. But did it ever seem to you that those who can neither give nor follow an account know anything at all of the things we say they must know? My answer to that is no. Then isn't this at last Glaucon the song that dialectic sings? It is intelligible, but it is imitated by the power of sight. We said that sight tries at last to look at the animals themselves, the stars themselves, and, in the end, the sun itself. In the same way, whenever someone tries, through argument and apart from all sense perceptions, to find the being itself of each thing, and doesn't give up until he grasps the good itself with understanding itself, he reaches the end of the intelligible, just as the other reached the end of the visible. Absolutely. And what about this journey? Don't you call it dialectic? I do. Then the release from bonds and the turning around from shadows to statues and the light of the fire and then, the way up out of the cave to the sunlight and there, the continuing inability to look at the animals, the plants and the light of the sun, but the newly acquired ability to look at the divine, at divine images in water and shadows of the things that are rather than, as before, merely at shadows of statues thrown by another source of light, that is, it itself a shadow in relation to the sun. All this business of the crafts we've mentioned has the power to awaken the best part of the soul and lead it upward to the study of the best among the things that are, just as before the clearest thing in the body was led to the brightest thing in the bodily and visible realm. I accept that this is so even though it seems very hard to accept in one way and hard not to accept in another. All the same, since we'll have to return to these things often in the future, rather than having to hear them just once now, let's assume that what you've said is so, and turn to the song itself, discussing it in the same way as we did the prelude. So tell us, what is the sort of power dialectic has? What forms is it divided into? And what paths does it follow? For these lead at last, it seems, towards that place, which is a rest from the road, so to speak, and an end of journeying for the one who reaches it. You won't be able to follow me any longer, Glaucon, even though there is no lack of eagerness on my part to lead you, for you would no longer be seeing an image of what we're describing, but the truth itself. At any rate, that's how it seems to me, that it is really... <coughs> Sorry... That it is really so is not worth insisting on any further, but that there is some such thing to be seen, that is something we must insist on. Isn't that so? Of course. And mustn't we also insist that the power of dialectic could reveal it only to someone experienced in the subjects we've described, and that it cannot reveal it in any other way? That too is worth insisting on. At any rate, no one will dispute it when we say that there is no other inquiry that systematically attempts to grasp with respect to each thing itself what the being of it is, for all the other crafts are concerned with human opinions and desires, with growing or construction or with the care of growing or constructed things. And as for the rest, I mean geometry and the subjects that follow it, we describe them as to some extent grasping what is, for we saw that, while they do dream about what is, they are unable to command a waking view of it as long as they make use of hypotheses that they leave untouched, and that they cannot give any account of. What mechanism could possibly turn any agreement into knowledge when it begins with something unknown, and puts together the conclusion and the steps in between from what is unknown? None. Therefore, dialectic is the only inquiry that travels this road, doing away with hypotheses and proceeding to the first principle itself, so as to be secure. And when the eye of the soul is really buried in a sort of barbaric bog, dialectic gently pulls it out and leads it upwards, using the crafts we describe to help it and cooperate, it wi cooperate with it in turning the soul around. From force of habit we've often called these crafts sciences, or kinds of knowledge, but they need another name, 
clearer than opinion, darker than knowledge. We called them thought somewhere before, but I presume that we won't dispute about a name when we have so many more important matters to investigate. Of course not. It will therefore be enough to call the first section knowledge, the second thought, the third belief, and the fourth imagining, or imaging, just as we did before. The last two together we call opinion, the other two intellect. Opinion is concerned with becoming, intellect with being. And as being is to becoming, so intellect is to opinion. And as intellect is to opinion, so knowledge is to belief, and thought to imaging imaging yes but as for the ratios between the things these are set over and the division of either the opinable or the intelligible section in two let's pass them by glaucon lest they involve us in arguments many times longer than the ones we've already gone through I agree with you about the others in any case, in so far as I am able to follow. Then do you call someone who is able to give an account of the being of each thing dialectical, but in, in so far as he is unable to give an account of something, either to himself or to another, do you deny that he has any understanding of it? How could I do anything else? Then the same applies to the good. Unless someone can distinguish in an account the form of the good from everything else, can survive all refutation as if in a battle, striving to judge things not in accordance with his opinion, but in accordance with being, and can come through all this with his account still intact, you will say that he doesn't know the good itself or any other good. And if he gets hold of some image of it, you will say that it's through opinion, not knowledge, for he is dreaming and asleep throughout his present life, and before he wakes up here, he will arrive in Hades and go to sleep forever. And just a quick comment there, um, he's mentioned uh, several times in this book 7, um, and if he gets hold of some image, you will say it's through opinion, not knowledge, for he is dreaming and asleep throughout his present life. Um, so that's very interesting and I'll, I'll remember that because a big part of Gurdjieff's ideas when we come to study them at some point through In Search of the Miraculous, one of the fundamental um, things that he states is one of his main propositions is that man is asleep, we go through our lives in a dream state just like what Plato's saying here. So I'm going to read that sentence again because I've digressed, but it's very interesting. And, and Jesus in the Gospels also mentions uh, sleep not, you know, wake up. And the Buddha also, I think even, um, where is it? In the Dhammapada, I think, that the Buddha means awakened one, I believe. So very interesting, all of those that perennial truth contained within all of these things. But anyway, back to the text. And if he gets hold of some image of it, you'll say that it's through opinion, not knowledge, for he is dreaming and asleep throughout his present life, and before he wakes up here, he will arrive in Hades and go to sleep forever. Yes, by God, I'll certainly say all of that. Then, as for those children of yours, whom you're rearing and educated in theory, if you ever reared them in fact, I don't think that you'd allow them to rule in your city or be responsible for the most important things while they are as irrational and incommensurable lines, or sorry, as irrational as incommensurable lines. Certainly not. Then you'll legislate that they are to give most attention to the education that will enable them to ask and answer questions most knowledgeably. I'll legislate it along with you. Then do you think that we've placed dialectic at the top of the other subjects like a coping stone, and that no other subject can rightly be placed above it, but that our account of the subjects that a future ruler must learn has come to an end? Probably so. And that uh, comes to the end of the five mathematical studies that Plato speaks about. And uh, hello there, green grapes, welcome. And, and so, yes, that was the, 
the details of the mathematical studies and now we come to um the selection of curric the selection and curriculum and so it's it's a more broader overview of the um education if i remember rightly and so we'll get to that right now selection and curriculum Plato first emphasizes the moral and more particularly intellectual virtues necessary in those who are to embark on the course outlined. He then specifies the length of time needed for each stage and the age at which it should be started. The first stage described earlier lasts till the age of 18. From 18 to 20 there are two years of physical training and military service. Then between the ages of 20 and 30 Selected candidates are put through mathematical disciplines. That stage is followed by five years of dialectic, any earlier introduction to which we are reminded is, we are reminded, very dangerous. Then follows fifteen years practical experience in subordinate offices, after which those who have survived all these tests are fully qualified philosopher rulers and divide their time between philosophy which they prefer and ruling. And this is a very intense and thorough education to be a, a philosopher ruler, as you'd imagine. And I believe, if I remember rightly, um, Pythagoras, if you wanted to be a Pythagorean, you first had to undergo, I think it's four, perhaps five, one of those numbers, four or five years of silence before you were allowed, um, yeah, into the school. So, um yeah, these, uh, this was no internet master class that you can just buy and sign up for. You had to, um, like he says, emphasizes the moral and intellectual virtues necessary. You had to have something about you. You couldn't just pay. Back to the text. Then it remains for you to deal with the distribution of these subjects, with the question of to whom we'll assign them and in what way. That's clearly next. Do you remember what sort of people we chose in our earlier selection of rulers? Of course I do. In the other respects, the same natures have to be chosen. We have to select the most stable, the most courageous, and as far as possible the most graceful. In addition, we must not only we must look not only for those people who have noble and tough character, but for those who have the natural qualities conducive to this education of ours. Which ones exactly? They must be keen on the subjects and learn them easily, for people's souls give up much more easily in hard study than in physical training, since the pain, being peculiar to them and not shared with their body, is more their own. That's true. We must also look for someone who has got a good memory, is persistent and, and is, in every way, a lover of hard work. How else do you think he'd be willing to carry out both the requisite bodily labours and also complete so much study and practice. Nobody would, unless his nature was in every way a good one. In any case, the present error, which, as we said before, explains why philosophy isn't valued, is that she's taken up by people who are unworthy of her, for illegitimate students shouldn't be allowed to take her up, but only legitimate ones. How so? In the first place, no student should be lame in his love of hard work, really loving one half of it and hating the other half. This happens when someone is a lover of physical training, hunting or any kind of bodily labour, and isn't a lover of learning, listening or inquiry, but hates the work involved in them. And someone whose love of hard work tends in the opposite direction is also lame. That's very true. Similarly, with regard to truth, won't we say that a soul is maimed if it hates a voluntary falsehood, cannot endure to have one in itself, and is greatly angered when it exists in others, but is nonetheless content to accept an involuntary falsehood, it's ang isn't angry when it, when it is caught being ignorant, and bears its lack of learning easily, wallowing in it like a pig? Absolutely. And with regard to moderation, courage, high-mindedness, and all the other parts of virtue, it is also important to distinguish the illegitimate from the legitimate. For when either a city or an individual 
doesn't know how to do this, it unwittingly employs the lame and illegitimate as friends or rulers for whatever services it wants done. That's just how it is. So we must be careful in all these matters, for if we bring people who are sound of limb and mind to so great a subject, and training and educate them in it, even justice itself won't blame us, and will save the city and its constitution. But if we bring people of a different sort, we'll do the opposite, and let loose an even greater flood of ridicule upon philosophy. And it would be shameful to do that. It certainly would. But I seem to have done something a bit ridiculous myself just now. What's that? I forgot that we were only playing. I forgot that we were only playing, and so I spoke too vehemently. But I looked upon philosophy as I spoke, and seeing her undeservedly besmirched, I seemed to have lost my temper, and said what I had to say too earnestly, as if I were angry of those responsible for it. That certainly wasn't my impression as I listened to you, but it was mine and I was speaking. In any case, let's not forget that in our earlier section we chose older people, but that that isn't permitted in this one, for we mustn't believe Solon when he says that someone grows older, that as someone grows older he's able to learn a lot. He can do that even less well than he can run races, for all great and numerous labours belong to the young necessarily. Therefore, calculation, geometry, and the preliminary education required for dialectic must be afforded to the future rulers in childhood, and not in the shape of compulsory learning either. Why is that? Because no free person should learn anything like a slave. Forced bodily labour does no harm to the body, but nothing taught by force stays in the soul. And here's another reference. He's saying, the learning... When you have taught something, it stays in the soul, not the mind, the soul. That's true. Then don't use force to train the children in the subjects. Use play instead. That way you'll also see better what each of them is naturally fitted for. That seems reasonable. Do you remember that we stated that the children were to be led into war on horseback as observers and that? Wherever it is safe to do so, they should be brought close and taste blood like puppies. I remember. In all these things, in labours, studies and fears, the ones who always show the greatest aptitude are to be inscribed on a list. At what age? When they're released from compulsory physical training, for during that period, whether it's two or three years, young people are incapable of doing anything else, since weariness and sleep are enemies of learning. At the same time, how they fare in this physical training is itself an important test. Of course it is. And after that, that is to say from the age of twenty, those who are chosen will also receive more honours than the others. Moreover, these subjects they learned in no particular order as children, they must now bring together to form a unified vision of their kinship both with the one, both with one another and with the nature of that which is. At any rate, only learning of that sort holds firm in those who receive it. It is also the greatest test of who is naturally dialectical and who isn't, for anyone who can achieve a unified vision is dialectical, and anyone else, and anyone who can't, isn't. I agree. Well then, you'll have to look out for the ones who most of all have this ability in them, and who also remain steadfast in their studies, in war, and in the other activities laid down by law. And after they have reached their thirtieth year, you'll select them in turn from among those chosen earlier, and assign them yet greater honours. Then you'll have to test them by means of the power of dialectic, to discover which of them can relinquish his eyes and other senses, going on with the help of truth to that which by itself is, and this is a task that requires great care. What's the main reason for that? Don't you realise what a great evil comes from dialectic as it is currently practised? What evil is that? Those who practise it are filled with lawlessness. They certainly are. Do you think it's surprising that this, that this happens to them? Aren't you sympathetic? Why isn't it surprising? And why should I be sympathetic? 
because it's like the case of a child brought up surrounded by much wealth and many flatterers in a great and numerous family, who finds out when he has become a man that he isn't the child of his professed parents and that he can't discover his real ones. Can you divine what the attitude of someone like that would be to the flatterers on the one hand and to his supposed parents on the other before he knew about his parentage and what it would be when he found out? Or would you rather hear what I divine about it? I'd rather hear your views. Well then, I divine that during the time that he didn't know the truth, he'd honour his father, mother and the rest of his supposed family more than he would the flatterers, that he'd pay greater attention to their needs, be less likely to treat them lawlessly in word or deed, and be more likely to obey them than the flatterers in any matters of importance. Probably so. When he became aware of the truth, however, his honour and enthusiasm would lessen for his family and increase for the flatterers. He'd obey the latter far more than before, begin to live in the way that they did, and keep company with them openly, and unless he was very decent by nature, he'd eventually care nothing for that father of his or any of the rest of his supposed family. All this would probably happen as you say, but in what way is it an image of those who take up arguments? As follows. We hold from childhood certain convictions about just and fine things. We are brought up with them as, our, with our, as with our parents and, ob and obey and honour them. Indeed, we do. There are other ways of living, however, opposite to these and full of pleasures, that flatter the soul and attract it to themselves, but which don't persuade sensible people who continue to honour and obey the convictions of their fathers. That's right. And then a questioner comes along and asks some, someone of this sort, What is the fine? And when he answers what he has heard from the traditional lawgiver, the argument refutes him, and by refuting him often and in many places, shakes him from his convictions and makes him believe that the fine is no more fine than shameful and the same with the just, the good and the things he honoured most. What do you think his attitude will be then to honouring and obeying his earlier convictions? Of necessity, he won't honour or obey them in the same way. Then, when he no longer honours and obeys those convictions and can't discover the true ones, will he be likely to adopt any other way of life than that which flatters him? No, he won't. And so, I suppose, from being law-abiding, he becomes lawless. Inevitably. Then, as I asked before, isn't it only to be expected that this is what happens to those who take up arguments in this way, and don't they therefore deserve a lot of sympathy? Yes, and they deserve pity too. Then, if you don't want your thirty-year-olds to be objects of such pity, you'll have to be extremely careful about how you introduce them to arguments. That's right. And isn't it one lasting precaution not to let them taste arguments while they're young? I don't suppose that it has escaped your notice that, when young people get their first taste of arguments, they misuse it by treating it as a kind of game of contradiction. They imitate those who've refuted them by refuting others themselves, and, like puppies, they enjoy dragging and tearing those around them with their arguments. They're excessively fond of it. Then, when they've refuted many and been refuted by them in turn, they're forcefully in they forcefully and quickly fall into disbelieving what they've believed before, and, as a result, they themselves and the whole of philosophy are discredited in the eyes of others. That's very true. But an older person won't want to take part in such madness. He'll imitate someone who is willing to engage in discussion in order to look for the truth, rather than someone who plays at contradiction for sport. He'll be more sensible himself and will bring honour rather than discredit to the philosophical way of life. That's right. <clears throat> And when we said before that those allowed to take part in arguments should be orderly and steady by nature, not as nowadays, when even the unfit are allowed to engage in them, wasn't all that also said as a precaution? Of course. Then if someone continuously, strenuously and exclusively devotes himself to participation in arguments, exercising himself in, in them, just as he did in the bodily physical training, which is their counterpart, 
Would that be enough? Do you mean six years or four? It doesn't matter. Make it five. And after that you must make them go down into the cave again and compel them to take command in matters of war and occupy the other offices suitable for young people so that they won't be inferior to the others in experience. But in these two they must be tested to see whether they'll remain steadfast when they're pulled this way and that or shift their ground. How much time do you allow for that? Fifteen years. Then, at the age of fifty, those who've survived the test and been successful both in practical matters and in the sciences must be led to the goal and compelled to lift up the radiant light of their souls to what itself provides light for everything. And once they've seen the good itself, they must each in turn put the city, its citizens, and themselves in order, using it as their model. Each of them will spend most of his time with philosophy, but when his turn comes, he must labour in politics and rule for the city's sake, not as if he were doing something fine, but rather something that has to be done. Then, having educated others like himself to take his place as guardians of the city, he will depart for the Isles of the Blessed and dwell there. And, if the Pythia agrees, the city will publicly establish memorials and sacrifices to him as a daemon, but if not, than as a happy and divine human being. Like a sculptor, Socrates, you've produced ruling men that are completely fine. And ruling women too, Glaucon, for you mustn't think that what I've said applies any more to men than it does to women who are born with the appropriate natures. That's right, if indeed they are to share everything equally with the men, as we said they should. Then do you agree that the things we've said about the city and its constitution are altogether wishful thinking, that it's hard for them to come about but not impossible? And do you agree that they can come about only in the way we indicated, namely, when one or more true philosophers come to power in a city who despise present, present honours, thinking them slavish and worthless, and who prize what is right and the honours that come from it above everything, and regard justice as the most important and most essential thing, serving it and increasing it as they set their city in order? How will they do that? They'll send everyone in the city who is over ten years old into the country, then they'll take possession of the children who are now free from the ethos of their parents and bring them up in their own customs and laws, which are the ones we've described. This is the quickest and easiest way for the city and constitution we've described to be established, become happy and bring most benefit to the people among whom it's established. That's by far the quickest and easiest way, and in my opinion, Socrates, you've described well how it would come into being if it ever did. Then isn't that enough about this city and the man who is like it? Surely it is clear what sort of a man will say he has to be. It is clear, he said, and as for your question, I think that we have reached the end of this topic. And we have reached the end of Book 7 of the Republic, and um, yes, Book 8, the next book coming up, he speaks about the different political characteristics of a state, as I mentioned, um, timarchy, oligarchy, democracy, and tyranny, and their relative or relevant individual natures. And so that's, uh, yeah, again, very interesting things to consider. So yeah, guys, if, uh, if you've got any questions, I think there's a few of you in the chat, if you've got any questions, please be sure to ask them before we go. Uh, otherwise, I'll just say, it, say again, please be sure to um, have liked the video, subscribe to the channel and share the show with your friends because I think that book seven, just like book six before it, are very beautiful um, pieces of philosophy and can really, like what Plato's saying, cause the soul to true think or true thought. <laughs> you know, the intellect, all of those mathematical um, studies he was saying, it's not for their own sake. Plato's not saying to do the mathematical studies so that you can pass a test, so that you can do your SATs or your GCSEs or your A-levels. He's saying that you should do 
your mathematical studies in order to think more more clearly be closer to the good and then once you've done those studies then you can begin your dialectical studies and that can take you closer to the good and away from opinion away from ignorance and so that's why Plato is saying all of these things and obviously Plato's philosopher ruler yeah it's possible as Plato says but as we see if we look around the political landscape in our current day and age it's very rare yeah very rare I don't see any sign of it myself not not in a, a true politi a, a true politician in in the sense that we think about them nowadays the the people serving in political office um and like like he says in one of those passages there that the true philosopher ruler should do it not because he wants to but because he's sort of obliged to he's obligated to serve because he is or she is the person to serve and so Audrey I'm glad you enjoyed it uh, and I'm glad that you're enjoying our study of Plato's Republic here uh, uh, I really think this is a great way to do it like a live audio ebook I did all the other audio ebooks of Plato's over on Lewis Kirk and hopefully that can survive a few more months but it seems like it could be nearing its end but we'll see about that. But Audrey, thanks for your generous super chat and I'm glad you're enjoying it and we'll be back next Thursday for book 8 about the different political systems and on Sunday we'll be reading McCormack's The Road. And so I really need as many of you as possible to be with me for that read because I think it's quite a disturbing story. And if I'm reading it on my own, I'll be terrified and uh, might not be able to cope. So please come and support me for that. And yeah, as always, guys, take care of yourselves. Enjoy the rest of your week. And I hope that you'll be able to make the road on Sunday evening. And we got so many more books to read. So be sure to subscribe and share the show with your friends and I'll see you all again very soon. Okay guys, take care now. See ya.